Good evening and um, good evening and welcome to the November lecture of the British Institute of Study Around. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Collins. I'm current chair of the Institute and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Uh, it's wonderful to look out on um, standing room only um, this evening and it's really no surprise at all given, uh, given uh, this evening's lecturer who I'm sure is known to um, many, if not all of you. Um, it's an enormous pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Lamial Galaniware, who um, really has been um, an invaluable friend to the British Institute. She is um, a research associate at the School of Oriental and African Studies and honorary research associate of the <coughs> Institute of Archaeology at UCL and has literally arrived back from New York, where she was a fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of New York. She is a native of Baghdad, but received her degrees from a number of institutions across the UK. Degrees in archaeology from Cambridge, masters from Edinburgh, and her PhD from the Institute of Archaeology in London. Between 1961 and 1969, she worked at the Iraq Museum. No one better qualified to talk about its history. She is the author of numerous articles and uh, a number of books, including the studies in the chronology and regional style of Babylonian cylinder seals, old Babylonian cylinder seals from the Hamrin, and chronological table of old Babylonian seal impressions, that you'll get a sense she's an expert in cylinder seals. Um, she's also the editor of a number of books, uh, including Of Pots and Pans, Papers on the Archaeology and History of Mesopotamia and Syria, presented to David Oates in honor of his 75th birthday. For the Institute, however, she has been um, uh, an extraordinary friend to us over many years, and in recognition of that, in 2009, um, BC awarded uh, Lamia the Gertrude Bell Memorial Gold Medal. This was for outstanding services to Mesopotamian archaeology. Uh, she joins an illustrious list of, of other names who had received the medal, that she's the fifth recipient. The first was given to Professor Sir Max Malouin, and then uh, Professor Seaton Lloyd, Professor David Oates, and Dr. Roger Morey also received gold medals. Tremendous achievement and well-deserved, not least, of course, um, to break the monopoly of, of middle-aged white men. Uh, she is, I think, uh, best summed up by um, the words of uh, Professor Roger Matthews, who was chairman of the British Institute in 2009, when he said of uh, Dr. Al-Galani, her unceasing efforts and invaluable advice and energies in sustaining academic and personal links between scholars in the UK and Iraq mean that uh, she has been a ray of intense and brave light in an age of darkness, difficulty. And on that uh, wonderful glowing reference, it's an enormous pleasure to invite her to give this evening's lecture, A Museum in Baghdad. Thank you, Paul, too much. Uh, and thank you all for coming. I hope you will not be disappointed. And thank you for the Institute, who, with... Ah, what happened? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Good. Um, and thank you, the Institute, and John McKeever, and Charles Tripp, for the idea of uh, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, conference on uh, Gertrude Bell, which compelled me to go to Baghdad 
and go through the archive there for anything about Gertrude Bell. And that got me into the archive because I found out that there is more than Gertrude Bell in these archives. Apparently, there are about four million uh, documents. I looked at several thousand, and especially for uh, the early period, the first nearly three uh, decades of the establishment of the museum from 1922 to the end of the 1950s. Um, I'm going to start first to talk about the directors who really established this institution. Um, there were seven of them. All of them are remarkable, but three very distinguished. Gertrude Bell, who, of course, established it. Saad al-Husri, who really uh, expanded it. He did quite a lot of, of, uh, of uh, activities. And Najil Asil, who carried on from Sata al husri And three of them um, share one thing. They are all, they were all who dabbled in politics. And they were all at one stage the authorities didn't want them in politics. So what to do with them? They didn't want to sack them because they were very distinguished, very well known. Um, and so the best thing, offer them the directorship of the antiquity department. It's a safe place. No politics and very good. And so when they got there, that probably they were the best directors that been at the uh, antiquity department. The trouble is, it's, this was happening at the beginning of the first half of the century, 20th century. When I told this to uh, Dr. Mu'ayyad Saeed, the former director in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s, and I said, this is what happened. That's what the government used to do when they don't want someone. They make him director. He said, it happened to me. <laughs> Look, <laughs> every communist in the university they don't want, they transfer him to the, to the antiquities. So <laughs> it's a good place. I, I urge everyone to, to become archaeologists. <laughs> um, Gertrude Bell and, uh, was busy in several issues. She established them, and these were the issues really that followed the seven directors after her. It, one is the excavations, secondly is the antiquities law, thirdly looking for a place to store her antiquities, and then looking for a museum. And all these, the same we see it with Sata al husri with the ones that came after Miss Bell, uh, Sidney Smith and Julius Jordan. Um, with the, the excavations, it was the first time that scientific excavations were being done in Iraq. They were mostly European and the majority were in southern Iraq. Um, and in fact, history was being made then, as Malawan said in his memoir when he went to uh, Ur. And we see today that many of the archaeologists, when we talk about periods and, uh, or characteristics, all these were, were found or researched or excavated during that period. Take Jamdat Nasser or Nineveh Five or the Ubaid Pottery, and it goes on like that. All these names in um, 
Iraqi history or archaeology was done at that period. And the uh, and then sensational um, discoveries like the Royal Cemetery by Wooly in Ur or um, the Warke excavations by the uh, Germans and even later the Malawans um, discoveries at Arpachia with the Halif period. All these were first. Everything nearly was done in that period was first. Neanderthal at Shanidar with Soleki working there. And we see Dorothy, Dorothy Garrett, who worked also on prehistoric Kurdistan. And I understand uh, this week she has been honored by having her name into a, build, a new building at Newnham College, Cambridge. So... Now, an archaeologist can claim that monuments in Britain is called after. Um, so, with all these uh, discoveries, we have so much antiquities. Ms. Bell, within a few months of her uh, appointment, she started looking for another room. She had only one room. Uh, given to her uh, immediately. Is it this way? Um, um, she was given a room in. Can you? Guess? I can't do it. It's the upper one. Can you show me? This one? This one? Yeah. It's this. This is the administrative center that was the Ottoman administrative center. And then during the British occupation, of course, it was the British commission there. And afterwards, even the Iraqi government. And Ms. Bell got a small room there. Within six months, she was looking for another one. And you find her uh, every other uh, document saying, can I, ha I heard such and such a room uh, empty. Can I have it? And uh, sometimes they give it to her. Sometimes they change their mind. They, once they gave her a uh, room, and then the next day they wrote to her, sorry, we gave it to the head of the vets. And uh, it looks like it's always animals because at one stage she looked for the uh, rabies dab, which was being vacated to, to store her antiquities. Um, <clears throat> and then by 1923, within a year, she started saying, can I have a museum? And at the beginning they, were, they told her we can't give you. She said, can I have a curator? They wouldn't give her that permission. Then within six months, they, uh, the government saw that it was impossible because within six months, she had over 6,000 objects and she didn't know where to put them. And so a museum was established. To look for a museum, again, it was a very difficult thing until she found the uh, government press, which is this one, was being vac uh, vacated, so she asked for it, and it's been a good one, and, uh, uh, and that became the Iraq Museum for nearly 35 years after her. She was able only um, to to do one room, she opened one room and the courtyard, and the room was called uh, the, uh, the, the, the Babylonian room. It's not the, really the one that she did exactly, but I think it was that room. It, no, sorry. Um, yeah, that one. It was, uh, it was that room, although this, it's mostly Sumerian, but it was called the Babylonian room. And uh, 
Later, um, the Assyrian room in the 1930s, when the, uh, uh, the, the bottom uh, slide, uh, when the uh, reliefs from Khursabat was brought to Baghdad, and the, this uh, room uh, uh, was used not only for um, uh, uh, you know, as an uh, Assyrian release, but it was the VIP room where all the kings and so on would come and uh, receive their guests. And from then on, it was the, uh, looking for another building. Even that one wasn't satisfactory for the, all the directors. Um, the one that followed Ms. Uh, Ms. Ben, uh, Richard Cook, unfortunately, uh, he didn't last long because of a very um, a scandal. One can say he, he, it, he was caught sending some antiquities uh, outside Iraq without a permission. Um, I'll talk about that later. Um, instead, uh, it was Sidney Smith who started really desperately asking for another museum, something to be built. Um, that was his idea, and it looks like that even the international community started talking about uh, a new museum to be built and maybe raising the money outside Iraq. That seems to have fizzled out. M uh, Sidney Smith's please sometimes was that he couldn't walk around the museum because ev everywhere there were boxes uh, trying to, uh, to persuade the government of giving him a, a new place. Um, after Sidney Smith um, uh, we had Julius, C uh, Julius Jordan, German uh, director, and he did persuade the government that a museum should be built and that a, an architect, a European architect, should design it. And he suggested at the time uh, a German architect called Werner Mark Known to many people as the designer of the Olympic Stadium in Berlin for the 1936 uh, Olympic Games, he uh, he started uh, corresponding with Mark from 1933. Mark accepted it, but then a, a, a plot of land wasn't uh, located for the museum. All the same, it followed by uh, uh, Sata al husri who, of course, was more dramatic than Sidney Smith in his plea for a new museum. He said, in one of the documents, he said to the uh, Minister of Education, please, please, Your Excellency, you've just been to the museum and you saw what the, the situation there. It is like explosives have been put under the museum, and one day it will explode, you know, to that extent that he was uh, uh, pursuing the, uh, the government to give him a, a plot. He, by the end, uh, succeeded in getting a little piece, a bit crooked. It's, uh, it's triangular. But at the same time, money wasn't there ready for, uh, for, the, uh, for the building. Mar did design it. He designed uh, a, a, a very uh, excellent um, plan, which is in style. It should be called Art Deco. It's exactly for the 1930s. But what is unique about it, it was built with bricks. And also he inspired, you know, he um, took in his plan um, consideration to 
Iraqi traditional uh, architecture, not only in the brick, but he did them. Uh, he planned it as courtyards with room around it as a, like a house, then with long passages as an alley. And it, I think till now it's one of the rare and unique buildings in Iraq and perhaps even in the world um, uh, the, uh, the, that said an art deco built with bricks. And he, he even inside in the interior, as you see in the lobby, all the walls of the corridors and the, uh, the, uh, the lobbies were done with ceramics that looked exactly like bricks. So it gave inside and outside gave the idea that it is an Iraqi, half Babylonian, Islamic. It's always been the same. The, 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 the plan was there, the, but it wasn't being built. Sata um, al-Husri was afraid that the land will be taken from him if they don't start building. So what can he do to, to secure the land? He decided to place... In the corners, three corners, in one corner, he had one lion, the ba Lion of Babylon, a replica of it, built there uh, in one corner. I thought I'll, I'll tell you a story about this lion. Um, Tata al-Hasri, again, did three replicas of the lion. One was put in the corner of the, uh, the plot of land for the Iraq Museum. One, he decided to give it to Basra. That's the Basra one. The Basra one. And the third one, and that's the lion uh, now, the Iraq Museum lion. In fact, it's now hidden inside the car park. Um, of the Iraq Museum. Um, but the third one, he gave it to Sydney Museum Australia. The trouble is that it arrived in pieces. And I, 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 I did follow, investig uh, investigated what happened to it. And unfortunately, they never um, they assembled. So they didn't put it together again. Um, on, the next, on the second corner, On the second corner, he asked Seton Lloyd, now his advisor. In fact, Seton Lloyd says, I didn't know what happened. I arrived, and he immediately asked me to go to Khorsobad and bring two winged bulls from there. said, I didn't know why he wanted them. Then I discovered that he wanted me to build an Assyrian gate at that corner in the hope that when they build the museum, it will be the main gate to the museum. And uh, at one, <laughs> C.T. Lloyd in his memoirs says that it was built, but there was a mistake when he was away in the arch, in the springing of the arch. I don't know, an architect would know what it means, but he said he had to keep not looking at it for the next 10 years when he was about that. Um, and uh, the two bulls were put, it looks like they were put as here showing. Showing. They put the bulls before they built the gate. Okay. Um, and that's the uh, gate Today, uh, with the big hole, it's now being filled, which is a pity I don't care. Uh, it's the, uh, one of the American cannon guns uh, made that hole.
the 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 museum was finished in 1966, and uh, in, in the top one of the things about it, it that's the original. Uh, the top one is the origin, how it looked like when it was open. One of the things when the uh, uh, being uh, when uh, the architect Sata al Hosri and later with Najil Asil and also with even the Prime Minister, they kept on telling him, but this building has no Islamic decoration. Sata al Hosri uh, suggested several. Uh, domes to be put to make it look more Islamic. And he refused. He said, this one you said for ancient uh, uh, antiquities, and you already have two Islamic museums, which is true, one at Shan Marjan and one at the Abbasid Palace then. And uh, he resisted, and it looks like they didn't succeed in making him put anything Islamic in this building. However, by the 80s, with Arab nationalism and the Baathist government, the door, the facade, uh, got an Islamic entrance. Yeah. And um, inside the building, they, they, I'm showing one or two what happened in museum that the um, the Assyrian hall and the Islamic hall yeah Islamic hall and this is was taken from the Marjani Esco so at the moment they uh, at the moment this room is being changed there is going to be a door here into a building into the courtyard, spoiling the, the character of the building, and uh, they are putting more Islamic material into the new building. 1966, it was open. So I thought it will be nice to show some few photographs from the building. Uh, the, uh, the president then, Abdurrahman Arif opening the building, some of the staff of the museum, some of the guests. Uh, what is interesting also, that the, um, uh, uh, Saad al Husri was still alive, living in Beirut. He was invited to come to the and there is Sata al with the director, uh, Dr. Taisal. <clears throat> the entrance at last has disappeared. Because now, in 2014, a new entrance was added, which to an extent has completely obliterated the uh, facade, the distinctive facade of the museum. Another activities that went on during that period, between 22 and to the 50s, uh, the, uh, Julius Jordan started a tradition which went really till now sometimes had it is to have temporary exhibitions it, which are really, um, um, it's for what has been discovered that year from the excavation. And that came because um, the, um, the people started questioning why all these um, foreign expeditions working in Iraq, maybe they are taking our antiquities. So the only way to persuade the people that this is not happening, two, two, uh, two activities were done. 
One started from the time of Sidney Smith, is to make public lectures, asking the excavators to do uh, some uh, uh, talks about their excavation, and the other one, the exhi uh, exhibi exhibitions, temporary exhibitions. This is one of them in 1933, which was one of the earliest one. Apparently, that year when this what, uh, when this exhibition was done, it was so successful that that year the museum received over 50,000 visitors. When you think that Baghdad didn't have even 200,000, they were not even half a quarter a million population. So it must have been very uh, successful. But the one exhibition that the museum and uh, the artists and so uh, the, were busy with was the uh, exhibition in Paris for the Paris Expo in 1937. Um, this is the building, um, the interior of the, the Iraqi, that's the Iraqi pavilion, that's the interior, and the, uh, many of the objects. Most of these objects were replicas, not real ones. I think the one that the British Museum does the British Museum has more than copy. They have the uh, Mescalamduk. Uh, uh, it's from this exhibition. And uh, because there, where is it? There. Ah. There. And that's the other one. I think you're ha you have this one now. Yeah, I think so. The VM has what, that one. So it's there. And there is, there is one a document that mentions that these will be sent afterwards to the British Museum. So, and most of them, I think, were made either in Baghdad or in Berlin. Some, the models of Babylon and uh, the uh, procession way uh, were made in, uh, in uh, Berlin. This, the third uh, problem that really kept them all busy was the uh, antiquities law. The antiquities law was very important because of the excavations and there was a lot of looting down in the south. Quite a number of the uh, uh, sites, like Clarsa, uh, Senkara, um, Fara, they were really being looted. Maybe not as much as in, during the 2003 uh, looting, but it was a very bad headache for everyone. And they were quite looters, were quite daring. I mean, once. When the police were, came to, to chase them, there was a gunfight. They wouldn't leave. And so the, uh, the antiquity uh, legislation started from the time of Miss Bell. She put the first one in 1924. But there was, at the time, there was some uh, opposition to it from the Iraqis. And uh, Salim al Lucy at the time told me, uh, that both the Minister of Works and the Prime Minister took the, took the opportunity when Ms. Bell went to, uh, to Britain on holiday, they amended the law before putting it to the, uh, to the Cabinet. And uh, that was sort of a story. But I found uh, uh, one of the uh, documents which shows that the High, uh, uh, the high Commissioner uh, was very angry about it. He reprimanded the minister, telling him, how did you send it to the cabinet before it came to me for approval? So uh, Miss Bell did come back, and the law was passed. But there was rumbling about the law, rumbling in the press, um, Especially, especially after uh, the 
the Cook affair, when the Cook was caught with him uh, trying to export antiquities without permission, and that really was a real scandal in Baghdad. Cook was sacked immediately and asked to leave the country. But the, uh, what happened is in Baghdad, there were ballads about him that uh, uh, the historian Rashid al Khayyun told me. He told me that there was even a rumor going around that the Cook's affair was mentioned in the Quran. And, and, and every newspaper in Baghdad had a leader comment on, on this business and that the advisors are uh, hopeless, they are not doing their job properly, and etc. Sidney Smith was, came immediately after Cook, so he really uh, suffered from this. And he was not happy in Baghdad because of that, really. I mean, he used to have the, the, all, the, uh, all the newspaper articles translated, and he was, at the end, he really asked to be, to be relieved. And so he was appointed as a, a curator in the, in the British Museum and left. And so that, and it made the government at the time to, to put a press release, but really telling them that this is uh, how it happened and that he's gone. And they found afterwards uh, uh, two staff went to uh, Cook's house and they found over 800 objects. They are all now in the Iraq Museum. So it was, it was a, a very damaging uh, incident that really resonated till now, because till now Iraq is dumb for an art. It's very difficult. It's, a, it's an unfortunate thing. It's, I think it was um, maybe ill-advised that they... Uh, appointed cook when they knew he used to double with selling antiquities before that. Um, so with the law, the law came into uh, a conflict, say, during Sata al-Husri. Sata al-Husri came and because of this pressure, uh, public pressure about the, uh, the law should be amended, um, he put one law, one, you know, uh, uh, a new law, which was first not accepted. So what he did, according even in his memoirs, saying that he just looked at original law and decided to play it with it to the letter. Before that, for instance, in the, in the law, that a representative should accompany, an Iraqi representative should accompany every expedition, but no one did it. So he started asking that an, uh, you know, a representative sh uh, should be appointed with the ex expeditions. Frankfurt was very, if Frankfurt in the Dayala region, the region was not happy with that. In fact, many of the others. Uh, like Woolley, Paro, and uh, who wanted to dig Atello, um, all of them left, except for the German state and then the American state in the Diana region. Um, so, but by 1936, there was a, a new law was legislated, and that one more or less, is what we have till today with some amendment. It's really the basic of any uh, antiquity, uh, the division of antiquities and everything else to do with the, uh, and, uh, the, uh, the Mesopotamian. And we come to the next uh, uh, Thing, and that's again will come to the, uh, the period of Sata al husri Sata al husri says that most of these excavations 
were not uh, were all on ancient sites. Europeans at that time were more interested in ancient Mesopotamia because, to an extent, it, they are more familiar with it. With the sites, mostly are biblical names, so they would have liked to uh, excavate them. He said he mentions in his memoirs that. Uh, one day, an Orientalist who was visiting Baghdad said to him, I can't believe that Baghdad used to be the center of the Islamic world, and yet you don't have a museum for Islamic antiquities. And Sata said with himself, wait, come in two years' time, and you will see what I do. And he turned then to, to what there is, if there are any buildings or monuments in Baghdad of, of the medieval period. And to his credit, it was him who really saved the, about half a dozen buildings in Baghdad of Maybe original uh, uh, Baghdad? No, more 11th and 12th centuries. Um, so the first one was Khan Mirjan, which he, it used to be really a Khan, where all the goods of, from the bazaar used to be stored there, and had it, uh, the, uh, the, uh, restored and made into an Islamic museum. At the bottom is a picture of nearly all the cabinet, of, uh, the prime minister, and even uh, um, uh, the Crown Prince Abdelilah, the prime minister, the AUB, the head of the, uh, what you call the, like the house of, the upper house of parliament. And the others are all ministers also um, uh, coming. So uh, the government did take uh, uh, interest in the archaeology, archaeological uh, activities. And secondly, because, you know, it's Fatah, sorry, he knows them all. And I think they are, to an extent, uh, fearful of him. If they don't turn up, he will write them quite rude letters. I, I've read several of them. Um, and this second one he, he uh, worked on is, uh, is the, uh, the only gate that was left in Baghdad, which is called the Babel Wastani, and he made it into an arms museum. And here, literally, the whole uh, cabinet did come. There is the Nuri Said standing. So, presuming that time Nuri Said was the Prime Minister, the others, there is Papa um, Al Husri himself. This is Sally Blau, uh, the assistant curator. Um, there, yeah, I think that's the curator. Um, uh, Abdurazak Lotfi. Um, and what the, the next time is was when they started uh, building new museums. So he built uh, one on the walls of Samarra. I thought I have. Uh, it's a view, beautiful small museum. Excavations. He also, uh, Saad al-Hasri, turned into excavating Islamic site, two sites, Samarra. I, I didn't put any slides here because everybody knows about Samarra. But the next most interesting site is the city of Wasit. Wasit was uh, the first capital for the Umayyad in Iraq. In, in Iraq. But it flourished more later in the Abbasid period. And this is uh, the gate into what 
is probably a school called the Rashidiya school, although they call it the Minaret building because it's supposedly this uh, uh, one is the Minaret. Unfortunately, it's, it's nowhere. It's in the middle of nowhere, south of Baghdad, um, and it's neglected. This is a photograph I've taken several, uh, only about three years ago, and you could see the humidity uh, going, coming up. They found a palace, they found a very interesting um, uh, mosque there. Not only that, the mosque, I was very interested when I was reading about it. It had uh, toilets with beautiful, beautiful uh, domes. Um, in Baghdad, um, uh, uh, again, uh, the medieval uh, building of the Abbasid Palace. It was in, in really in ruins, and he he succeeded in getting it and beginning the restoration, but the restoration get, went on till the 1960s. It's a very laborious work, and it was really one of the big achievements of the Antiquity Department of working on the, um, uh, all the um, uh, decoration. It sort of revived that ancient uh, medieval type of brick decoration. The same later on during the time of uh, Najil Asil, um, the Mustansariya school was also uh, restored. So these are, these are really the main things um, of, of the acti activities of the Department of Antiquity and the Iraq Museum. I thought also I will talk about one or two objects which have their own stories. Um, one of them is um, a basin. A basin, it's a, uh, um, sorry. Uh, a basin that is was found in Al Ashiq Palace in summer, it's over two tons. At the time, this why it's a story. They didn't know how to carry it, uh, transfer it from the from the, uh, the palace across the river uh, and down to Baghdad. And they even thought of the. Um, uh, these uh, traditional boats, the Kelek, I don't know what you call them, the ones with the, you call them Kelek? It's like when the, they brought the, uh, uh, the bulls down to Basel. Uh, but that, uh, at the end, of course, Miss Bell, that was, it was found in 1924, and Miss Bell, so, uh, you know, with her own connections, got the, uh, uh, the railway will carry, carry it about that. And it had a nice history because it was pride of place just under Miss, Miss Bell's bus in the first at the museum. Then it was removed uh, to uh, to Khan Marjan. And everyone that went to Khan Marjan would have a photograph here, the Arab uh, guides. Um, and the uh, and then at last, at last the uh, the, the, the the basin was uh, transferred into its let's say resting place in in the Abbasid Palace. Another interesting object, it's a statue, half a statue now. But originally, a complete statue uh, was found in the 19th century in, by Luftus in Namrud and then disappeared 
then appeared again in a house on the roof of a house in Karmain, north of Baghdad. Uh, Julian Reed uh, drew my attention to it and said, can you find out what happened you know, with it or how did they get it to the museum? Um, I didn't need to go far because Miss Bell in one of her letters talks about it and she says to her father that she's just going to Karamea Karamean and because there is a statue. So she went there and she found the statue in a house which empty of its owners, only for a caretaker. And this only the half of the statue was there. And she decided to take it, and as she said, as the house belonged to Sir Iqbal Dawleh, and as he is a British subject, and we are looking after his property, so I think I can have this statue to my museum. So, so that's the other. Nobody knows if this is uh, a female, which I think it's a better uh, had Some think that it's a eunuch. But I think it's more yeah. Herzfeld thought she was semi -ramis. That's difficult to say. Another one, and that's a mystery. I found a document, in fact, three documents, which mentions that a wing pole after the flood and the, there is part of a wing pool see, in the river. It was, it appeared between Pashtabia and uh, the shrine of Yahya al Qasim, south of Musi. And of course, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the person who, oh, I think he was a Mufetish. In, uh, in Mosul, saying that we found this one and what can we do with it? And the idea is that we're, uh, it should be removed to be put in one of the squares in Mosul itself. But unfortunately, there is no mention for it except in these three documents. In the third document, he is rather frustrated with the, with the Baghdad because nothing has come to tell him what to do with it, and he complained that, please, you have to do something because the women of the villages around are using it as a stepping stone to wash their clothes in the river. So, um, and then nothing. I, of course, at the time when I found this document, I uh, message, sent a message to Julian Reed. Julian didn't know anything about Zahim Hussein didn't know about it. I asked Leila Saleh to go around in Mosul to ask about it. No one knew. No. So uh, maybe one day we'll find more documents to tell us if this has been left in the, in the river and maybe drifted again. We don't know why it's there. No one has mentioned that they've lost uh, a ball. <laughs> so... And I have to talk about a very important issue, again, uh, seldom of, or overlooked by many of the art historians in, in, in Iraq. The, the museum played a very important role in encouraging the art by really at the, in the 1930s, 40s, and even to the 60s. Uh, by employing artists in the museum. First, as conservators, because there were no professional conservators in the area. So all the very famous artists like uh, Jawad Salim, um, Khalid al-Rahal, and others, all worked in the museum. And one of the last of these uh, distinguished artists who worked in the museum was Ghia al azawi and all of them were influenced by what they saw 
in the in uh, a museum, and their work has even helped in uh, the public to associate with these objects and became iconic sometimes. If we take, uh, for instance, uh, Fuabi's, but the Iraqis still call her Shab'a, King Shab'a. This is the statue done. The statue was made by Khalid al Rahal, but being everywhere. Now, it's, this one is a, is a uh, you see it everywhere, it's even at a stamp. Uh, it, 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 uh, Jawad Salim was commissioned to do an Assyrian um, uh, carriage which paraded in Iraq, in Baghdad, during the coronation of King uh, Faisal II. And so is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Lear of Ur that. Uh, that was also commissioned by another uh, sculptor, Abdul Rahman Al Gailani, to do it. And he did, and the head, as a little story, the head is the one that has been, was looted in 2003. The real head is in the museum, uh, in the bank. Another icon, and again, all the Iraqis. Um, uh, to have is the Ashtar Gate. In, in fact, it's, this is the Ashtar Gate in Babylon that the Iraqis know. Uh, it's a replica. It's a replica. They don't know the one uh, in Berlin, the real one. But the replica has been uh, imitated. The, the embassy down in the Iraqi in Amman, and there is one in the in one of the Gulf uh, embassies. Um, that was a proposed, uh, the Iraq Museum at one stage wanted an Ashtar gate as an entrance to the museum. Thank goodness it did it. Uh, and this is only recently I saw as a part of like uh, the procession street from Babylon in one of the art schools. Um, lately, I, although I'm coming to recent dates, but this is interesting, is the winged bull, because of Daesh in Mosul. The winged bull became uh, a symbol of resistance. One artist has a very moving uh, picture of Mosul bleeding with the bulbs on either side of it. Uh, but this one, I thought. And this is about that. And to celebrate the uh, liberation of Mosul, the Iraq Museum held a fashion show. The fashion show. It's the point, again. <laughs> and last, I thought I'll put one or two photographs from what I saw in the archive. Um, uh, some has history, stories, some, yes, I like them. Um, one is in Matina. Did I say it right? No? Because um, this is the original and that Iraq it has number five in the Iraq Museum catalog. So it's one of the earliest things. In fact, at the time when it was discovered, immediately Willie wrote to uh, Miss Bell telling her of it. And when she went, she said, of course, we got that hideous statue. But then it's for an important king, which we haven't heard about before. So, <laughs> and this is, this is 
uh, it was looted in 2003. And unfortunately, it got a little bit a bruise from the looting and taking it down the stairs, and they broke all the stairs, uh, the marble stairs in the museum because of because they slid it down. Um, and then it's a long story of it traveling around the world until it was brought back to me. Um, this is one of my favorites. The whole staff in 1939. This is the Entron, the uh, photographer, very famous for a lot of Iraqis. He was in the museum for nearly 40 years, so most of the good photographs in the museum is the work of Antran. Uh, this is Bashir Fancy. He was the one who was the translator and so on. Next to it is uh, Salim Lawi. Salim Lawi, the assistant uh, 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 curator, uh, and he was the one who, the only one that Sidney Smith um, succeeded in making him learn how to do the cuneiform. Because Sidney Smith decided that they should have somebody who can read cuneiform in the museum. And there were only three staff at the time. Uh, Adereza Klutfi, who became later director of, of, uh, curator of the museum. And they were three, one Muslim, one Christian, one Jewish. According to Salim al alusi this is his story, that Abdur Zaklatvi, the Muslim, lasted only one week and disappeared. And the Christian, I forgot his first name, but he's from the Benna family, lasted about four weeks. It was only... Uh, uh, Salim Lawi, who persisted and learned to you know, find, and I think Sidney Smith at the time uh, 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 took him to the museum, uh, to the British Museum, to learn more on Cuba. Um, so this is one story. The next one you could see the bottom picture is from 1945, and that the museum. And the staff has expanded and more and more of them. At the moment, I think I was told that the antiquity department employed 3,000 uh, officials. Um, another one is, is the janitor in absolute uniform, which I haven't seen recently. But everybody was, and then the security. These are all photographs from the 1930s. But one of the most important is this fantastic picture of Hagar Kuf at the back, and you find a whole row of distinguished archaeologists, Iraqis, and there is a Gothic. I, um, I that Alexandre, Najil Asil, the director, a Shibibi chef, is was minister of Malawan, and I can't, I think this is Taku, uh, uh, and I think this one is Akram Shukri, and there is It's a whole, it's a, it's a real historical uh, uh, photo. My favorite is coming. And Tron, the photographer with pottery. I, I think mostly Halef pottery. Or is it Halef or Obeid? Or a mixture. But it's a lovely picture. And my last is my favorite uh, a lot of people know Haji Abid. Haji Abid was in the museum 
just under 70 years. He, he was employed when he was 14 years old and uh, was in the museum only about a um, few months before he died. Um, and thank you. Amir, um, yeah, thank you very much indeed for an extraordinary journey through the history of the museum. And I think there's obviously going to be lots and lots of questions you're going to have um, to ask, but I think we'll probably reserve those for the reception. So um, in order, before we invite you to join us with a drink and celebrate Amir's fantastic talk, um, I'd like to invite uh, the Institute's president, Dr John Curtis, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you so much, um, Lamia, for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, there can be few museums uh, in the world, I think, that have seen such um, turbulent uh, times uh, as the Iraq Museum uh, in Baghdad. It's a very um, remarkable story uh, and one that deserves to be told uh, in full for posterity. And, of course, there's no better person um, to do this um, than Lamia. And she's taken us on a wonderful journey um, from 1926 onwards, reminding us of the uh, many people who've been associated with the museum um, uh, during that time. And many of us here will have our favorite memories of um, particular people uh, in the museum. My own uh, of the Farash Abed, whose uh, picture is up on the screen here, and uh, who um, brought out objects for people to uh, study. He was unfailingly helpful. And I also very warmly remember uh, Donny George, who was director for a short time um, after 2003 and achieved so much during the very short time uh, that he was um, director of the museum. Well, you'll all be familiar um, with the... Uh, photographs uh, of the museum in 2003 of the terrible um, devastation and um, damage uh, that there was um, at that time. Uh, and it's remarkable, really, that 12 or 13 years later, it was possible um, to reopen completely um, all the galleries um, in uh, the museum. And I have to say that that was largely possible because of the efforts of Lomia. From 2003 um, onwards, she worked, first of all, very closely with the Coalition Provision, uh, Provisional Authority, uh, and then uh, with the staff uh, in the museum, restoring um, uh, their morale, um, encouraging them to... Um, uh, to, to, to uh, visit the records uh, of, of the museum, uh, put things back in the cases, and um, so on and so forth. It's impossible, um, Lamia, to overestimate the contribution um, that you've made um, during um, that time. Um, she also didn't tell us that for the last uh, year or so, she's been, uh, I think it's called a special research fellow in the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York. Uh, and her role during that time um, was to write a book uh, about, the, um, about the history of the Iraq Museum, which I believe um, is a project um, that's well advanced and we look forward very much um, to the publication of that book. But in the meantime, I'd like to say thank you very much, Lamia, for a wonderful talk uh, tonight and invite you all to join with me in thanking her. Thank you.